Today's story is about a man who is a popular icon, a war veteran, and a sports hero. In his lifetime, he would become the face of America's pastime. But there's a lot more to this man than most people know. Hi, my name is Gabe Bauer, and this is Top Shelf History, where we combine great stories with great drinks. This is the Frozen 400. It is the cocktail I have made for you today and is named after one of my favorite athletes of all time, Ted Williams. The cocktail is made with orange juice, grapefruit juice, simple syrup, grenadine, and tequila. Now, as a kid, baseball was my favorite sport. I was obsessed with it. My parents would try to sign me up for Cub Scouts or other activities and I was having none of it. I remember when I was three years old, I would sit in my dad's lap and I would ask him questions of every aspect on every pitch to every batter as long as he would let me. And he would normally last about three innings or a third of the game before he would finally kick me out. But I would follow Ted Williams' footsteps in my playing days, specifically in the fact that I wore number nine. And the reason why is because when my dad could no longer answer my unending questions about baseball, uh, I turned to books instead. And I remember reading how Ted Williams was the last player to hit 400 in a season for a batting average and thinking to myself how I wanted to be the next. Now, to give you a little bit of context here, the baseball batting average among most major league hitters throughout the whole league is around 250, so around one in every four at-bats do you get a base hit. Getting 400 average, two in every five, is practically unheard of. There's a reason why nobody has been able to do it since 1941. More than that, I didn't realize just how difficult it is to crack a major league roster. I mean, to be one of the 750 major league baseball players on any given year, but that didn't lessen my love for the game or for my favorite player. Now, let's get into my favorite player. Ted Williams was born in San Diego, California in 1918. He was a natural born athlete and he started off his professional baseball career playing for the then minor league San Diego Padres. This was before they became a major league franchise way down the line, around the 60s. And Ted Williams was pretty much just a kid with enormous amount of potential and he was smart and he could play really, really well. And in 1937, Eddie Collins, the general manager for the Boston Red Sox, was scouting out a new potential athlete in future Hall of Famer, Bobby Doerr. Now, when he was scouting Doerr, he came across Williams and noticed his immense potential to be a baseball phenom, and he would then negotiate with the San Diego Padres general manager to purchase Williams' contract. By 1939, Ted Williams was on his way to Sarasota, Florida to participate in his first ever spring training with his new team. It didn't take long for Ted to become a phenom and the apple of the Boston crowd's eye as he had wonderful hand-eye coordination, uh, stellar memory, practically photogenic, and he had phenomenal physical attributes in terms of his ability to hit the ball for power. Over his career, Ted Williams would hit 344 for an average, which is just absurd if you know baseball at all. I mean, again, baseball average, around 250. Ted Williams for a career 344 average. His on-base percentage for his career was around 482, which is the best on-base percentage for a career in baseball history. No one is better at getting on base than Ted Williams. So, Ted Williams was able to get on first base or better from his at-bats 48.2% of the time. That is a mind-blowing statistic. But in 1941, Ted Williams would do the thing that nobody else has done since, hit for 400 in a season. Ted Williams was raking the ball left and right, having the year of pretty much everybody's life. Coming into the final day of the season, Ted Williams was hitting .3995, which round would round up 
to 400 for the season. But instead of listening to his manager who suggested, hey, we can sit you out for this final double header we're having against the Philadelphia Athletics, Ted Williams said, no, I'm going to earn it and there's going to be no dispute over my ability to hit 400. In those two games, Ted Williams went six for eight and he finished the year hitting 406. An absolutely phenomenal and totally Ted Williams way to finish out the season. A little cocky, but darn it, he could back it up. Following his 1941 season, Ted was practically in the prime of his life, and his best baseball years seemed to be ahead of him, but they would be cut short, at least for three years, as Ted would be called into active service to serve for the U.S. military in World War II. He would be a naval aviator and part of the Marine Corps, so he would be flying planes. So from 43, 44, and 45, Ted Williams didn't play, and this was around the prime time of his career. It's even speculated that had Ted Williams played, he would have broken many, many more records. After that, Ted Williams would come back in 1947, and he would continue his phenomenal career all the way up until 1952, where he was yet again called back into military service. This time, he wasn't all too happy about it. Regardless, when he was put into that role, he refused to just sit it out and hang out in the stateside. He decided, I'm going to Korea and I'm going to fly. And he flew 39 air combat missions as wingman of future U.S. Senator and astronaut John Glenn, who spoke of Ted Williams saying that he was one of the best pilots he had ever seen. The U.S. military would also recognize Williams' abilities as a pilot as they would give him many commendations for his service in Korea, among them being two gold stars. Williams would come back to Major League Baseball in 1953 and continue his career all the way up until he retired at the age of 41 in 1960. Mind you, in his 41st year, in his last final season playing in Major League Baseball, Ted Williams hit 316. Ted Williams would quickly be inducted into the Hall of Fame following that 1960 season, as in 1966 he would be welcomed into Cooperstown among the greats. He would have a short managerial career later that we will get into in our last call, and Williams would enjoy a nice retirement after that. Now, there are two things that most people may not know about Ted Williams. I mean, we know a lot about Ted Williams, but there are two that I think many people may not. Firstly, that he was actually part Mexican. His mother, whose maiden name was Vensor, was actually Spanish-Mexican-American who came from El Paso, Texas. Now, the second thing that most people don't know about Ted Williams is that his head is frozen. I'm not kidding. In 2002, after he passed away, there was actually a riff between his uh, kids over what to do with his body afterwards, whether to bury it or not. Now, mind you, Ted didn't really want to be cryogenically frozen, especially just his head, which is what it was. It was just his head, kind of like the beginnings of Futurama's Head Museum, for those of you who watch that show. But there was enough ambiguity in Williams' will that there could be a conversation <laughs> or an argument, I should say, about this particular issue. And after arguing for a while among the kids, cryogenics went out. Today, Ted Williams' head is at a cryogenics facility in Arizona, just chilling. Okay, now we've heard the story, let's get into the drink. Now remember, this is the Frozen 400, so much like poor Ted's head, this one will also be frozen. Uh, it will be put on ice so to speak. And we'll start this drink by putting in three ounces of tequila. Now this is somewhat of an homage to Ted Williams's Mexican heritage, but it's also because I love tequila. And I really do. I spilled a little bit, but I'm gonna make up for it. There we go. We're going to follow that up with one ounce of grapefruit juice. Now, for those of you who are baseball fans, can you tell me why I'm using grapefruit juice? If you can't, then the reason is, is because Florida's spring training league that every baseball player goes through from late February to the end of March is called the Grapefruit League. Bet you didn't know that. Um, and most of the time the games are as bitterly disappointing as this juice. Just saying because they throw in a lot of prospects and then it gets boring. But 
In the beginning, it's fine, much like the juice. We'll follow that up with one third of simple syrup, or one third of an ounce, I should say, of simple, th simple syrup. And this will add some very needed sweetness to our drink, and also because, much like Ted Williams, it had, who had a sweet swing. It's a weird way of saying that. Then we're going to follow that up with one third of an ounce of grenadine. And finally, we will mix this all together with three ounces of orange juice. Now this will just add enough tart and sweetness to balance out all of the syrupiness and sugar and bitterness from the grapefruit juice that you would see all in one really nice and cohesively. So we'll fill this all up here, put that in. And then lastly, you could mix all this up and it'd be a very sweet kind of gross drink. And the reason why is because this is a frozen drink. And with frozen drinks, you're throwing in a lot of ice, which will end up diluting a lot of the flavors in the drink. So we're gonna throw in around four ounces, maybe a little bit more if you want to get more of that slushy consistency into our drink to make sure that it comes out that frozen slush deliciousness but we need intense flavors with frozen drinks just to help kind of combat that dilution. So, throw in all that. And then, with the magic of television, I'm going to pulse blend this, and for you, this will take a second, where for me, it will take probably a few minutes. So we're gonna throw our top in and begin. That's about right. All right, next thing that we're going to do is that we are going to salt our margarita glass because this is a lot like a margarita, almost like a, a frozen tequila sunrise, if you could say. So we're going to salt our glass. Now, if you can't see any of that, but what I've done is that I took two home sponges because I didn't have a good sponge and I filled them up with lime juice. Now you could do this yourself. Make sure that they're unused or you're gonna get a lot of flavors that are really gross and you just press in your margarita glass into the top of those, and then I just put out some good margarita salt, and you can find that at any store. And that is how you are going to salt that. Then we are going to pour out our slush-filled frozen 400 here into our glass. This is a little bit more liquidy than I initially wanted it, but that's okay because if you have something that's too liquidy, just throw in more ice and you'll get uh, more of a frozen slush look. And then finally, we're going to garnish with a slice of grapefruit. And there you have it, the frozen 400. Now it looks pretty good. I'm sure it's doing a lot better than uh, poor Ted is currently, but let's give it a taste. Mmm, that's good. You know, even, even so, the salt is a little bit distracting here. So if you wanna go without salt, it would be perfectly fine. A lot of the flavors here are very subtle, so you may wanna increase uh, some more of the quantities if you want more bold flavor, especially from the grapefruit or the orange juice in sweetness. Um, but it's really, really good. I do love the, the mix of that orange juice and grapefruit juice because you get that tart, but you also get that slight amount of bitter that's oh so refreshing. The simple syrup comes around as well to really mellow everything out and give a nice subtle sweetness. That same thing with the grenadine adds a little bit of, of freshness to there. And then with that tequila, you have that sweet, delicious tequila and it really comes through in a not too overpowering way, which I really like. This is a great drink that I would love to have if I were ever going to a spring training game. I'd just be chilling out on the lawn and having myself a frozen 400 thinking of the days of old. And that sounds like last call. So Ted Williams, after he finished his baseball playing career, decided, all right, let me go into managing. And he would actually manage the then Texas Rangers who had just moved from the Washington Senators 
out to Arlington, Texas uh, to begin their franchise. And in the few years that Ted Williams actually coached, it wasn't great. He wasn't nearly as successful as he was in his baseball career. He would actually end with a losing record. And he couldn't always understand why his players didn't think or study or play like he did. And that would lead into a lot of his struggles, you could say, as he was coaching. But Ted Williams' legacy is immense. I mean, he wrote a book on how to hit a baseball and it was copied by so many baseball hitters and so many baseball scholars throughout the ages and read and just to understand how the greatest hitter in history had an approach to hitting. He talked about the strike zone. He talked about the swing path. He talked about swinging up towards a ball as opposed to Ty Cobb, who way back in the day said to swing down on a ball. Now, Ted Williams swinging up on a ball actually met a pitcher's pitch at the right angle to allow him to hit the ball square and be far more successful in the future. Ted Williams is mine. Perhaps it wasn't built for a managerial role, but it was built for a coaching role because although not everybody could play or think or had the natural abilities that Ted Williams had, his student of the game mentality that he brought to baseball and it changed baseball forever. Thank you all so much for watching. Uh, before we go, I just want to tell you guys to please uh, consider signing up for our mailing list. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, why do I want to sign up for a mailing list? Well, that's because on there we have so much exclusive content, articles, videos. You get early access to our videos. You also get exclusive drinks. I have two of them that I've sent out already, and it also is our prime source of interaction between you guys and me. When I take suggestions or what have you, I can just interact with you guys in a more personal way. But back to what I was saying before, if you guys are interested in any more of our historically inspired cocktails, you can find them here or at our website at topshelfhistory.com. There we also have all of our blogs, videos, recipes, deep dives, and more from all of us here at Top Shelf History. Remember, History is better with a drink. Cheers.